Edgar Allan Poe. As we have seen, he was enthralled with the mysteries of love and beauty. Perhaps this was the result of watching three important women in his life die. His mother, an actress, his foster mother, and finally his wife, who was both his wife and his cousin. And beyond that, his relationships with women were always tangled. A fiancé taken from him by his parents, uh, who arranged her marriage to someone else. Later in life, after the death of Virginia, his uh, cousin, he met and was enthralled with that lost fiancé again. Meanwhile, he kept up dozens of flirtations with admiring women after her death, seeming to need their adulation and attention. Not surprising that we find his poetry filled with beautiful women, either women far beyond him like Helen or Lygea, or women lost to death like Annabel Lee, Lygea, Eleonora, and we'll see Lenora coming up in The Raven in, in a few minutes. But there's another side, many other sides to Poe. There are tales of voyages into a vast unknown, like the manuscript found in a bottle, or the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, not assigned on the course. This is a 25-chapter tale, 130 pages long, the only piece of writing where Poe ventured beyond his ideal of a tale short enough to be read in one sitting. And also there are tales of guilty crimes, like the cask of Amontillado, the black cat, and the telltale heart. And finally, there are strongly allegorical and symbolic tales, again, like the Mask of the Red Death and the Fall of the House of Usher. Welcome to English 3350, a survey of American literature before the Civil War. We're in Studio 3 at the M.D. Anderson Library on the main campus of the University of Houston. I'm Barry Wood, and today we're continuing with our look at Poe and his place in this very important movement of the 19th century, the Romantic Movement. If Poe's relationship with women was confused and troubling, so too those with his parents. His biological father abandoned his mother, and after her death and his adoption by uh, John Allen, he found himself a son to a truly overbearing man. Of course, one might not be uh, surprised that John Allen was upset when young Edgar built up uh, a whole host of gambling debts at, while he was at the University of Virginia. But his rejection of Edgar included his talents, his ambitions, his inclination towards writing poetry and stories. And in rejecting these, of course, John Allen earned the everlasting antipathy of his foster son. It has been noted that there are no parents in Poe's tales, no fathers. And in that light, we might begin with a look at the story, The Telltale Heart. This is a very finely wrought little tale, a mere uh, four pages in length. The plot is deceptively simple. The narrator murders an old man, but then having successfully hidden the body, he confesses his crime. The, we, the uh, one interpretation of this is, of course, as a supernatural story. We've seen how Lygea can be interpreted this way as a supernatural story in which a, a dead body is brought to life when it is possessed by the spirit of someone who has died. Such supernatural interpretations were very common in post time in the 19th century. This tended to be the way that these stories uh, were interpreted. The stock response of the reader was to see these in supernatural terms. And this would mean that this story, uh, The Telltale Heart, would be read as uh, an example of the body under the floor coming to life and the heart beating. Uh, 
we can dispense with this kind of supernatural interpretation um, because we, we really have a different perspective on human psychology now. I think most readers uh, see that the beating heart is probably the narrator's own beating heart as he's being interviewed by the police and uh, he's projecting that on the body under the floor. Uh, though the tale does admit, of course, of a supernatural interpretation, but I think that we can definitely uh, uh, lay the, the noise under the floor at the heart, at the, at the narrator's own guilty heart. The narrator begins this story with these words, true, nervous, very, very nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. Well, sir narrator, you protest too much. Keep in mind that this story was written after the narrator has been arrested for a crime and he is probably in jail. And so the story is a kind of defense, but perhaps with a little bit too much defensiveness. He's writing up this account, presumably trying to uh, show us that he really isn't mad. Possibly, but he is most certainly obsessed. Look at those words, for instance, in the middle of that quotation. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. I would say that those words would indicate delusions, hearing things, uh, acute senses. So this, this man, uh, despite his um, protesting, is, um, is certainly there's something wrong with him and he protests a little too much about his own madness. Obsessed with what? Well, the eye of the old man. Who is the old man? Well, uh, servant perhaps? owner of the house where the narrator is living. We really know nothing about him. Moreover, there seems to be no motive for him to even be murdered. In fact, uh, the narrator says that. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. All we know of him is, in fact, uh, his eye, which aggravates the narrator, and it is only the eye that, that uh, aggravates the narrator. He, he admits that he has no other f uh, negative feeling towards this man. He's particularly kind to him all through the week when he's observing him, when he's sneaking around looking in his room at night. And it's not two eyes, it's just one eye. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Wherever it fell upon me, my blood, whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. The eye seems to be uh, very sinister and also somewhat symbolic. It's been suggested that the, the old man in this story is a kind of father, overbearing, watching, judging. And uh, if this is the case, the, the uh, eye certainly stands as a wonderful 
symbol for uh, that overbearing quality that uh, the old man has. The eye is all-seeing, like a father's eye watching the child. Thus, it's feared, it's annoying, it's resented. And, of course, such a view makes sense from what we know of John Allen, just such a watchful, overbearing eye. The murder, then, which the narrator says has no reason, has probably a subconscious reason to rid himself of the eye, which symbolically stands for the, the overbearing father. Shining the light in the old man's eye repeatedly is a kind of reversal. In effect, this blinds the old man. The eye becomes, is no more effective for looking at uh, the narrator. Uh, in this sort of situation, the old man wouldn't be able to see the narrator. All he'd be able to see is this blinding ray of light shining right in his eye and everything else around in a kind of darkness. So the, the light shone on the eye by the narrator turns the eye back on itself. And attacking and murdering the old man is a triumph then for the narrator. And the murder is definitely seen this way by the narrator. There's a kind of exaltation that he takes in, in putting this eye, putting out th this eye forever, uh, killing the, um, the man. So at the end of the story, the eye is gone. The old man is murdered, the body has been dismembered, and the corpse has been hidden. But, of course, it's not that simple. The reason for the, the murder has not been removed. The ultimate source is in the narrator. His own deep abiding insecurity, his guilt, whatever was threatened by that all-seeing eye is, is still with them. And now it merely surfaces in a new way as a throbbing, pounding heart. His own guilty heart projected beneath the floorboards. Thus, if he wasn't mad at the beginning, if he was sane enough to argue that he wasn't mad, he most certainly goes mad in this story. Surrounded by three police officers, he grows pale, he talks with a louder voice, he gasps for breath, he talks more quickly, more vehemently, he argues, he gesticulates uh, violently, he paces up and down the room trying to drown out the sound of the beating heart under the floorboards. He foams, he raves, he swears, and finally projects the knowledge of his crime onto the officers who are simply sitting there politely conversing. He sees their politeness, their quietness as a mockery. He sees hypocrisy in their smiles and driven utterly mad by this uh, situation. He confesses. And the story ends there and as I say we can assume that the story then is written from the, the point that he has now been arrested and, and is in jail awaiting whatever punishment. And uh, if you read the story a second time from that perspective, you, you can see the elaborate subterfuge going on, the way in which he's trying to uh, uh, explain why he did it, make it all seem rational and logical, and trying to make himself seem very logical and rational in what he did. It's as if I had to do this. It was absolutely necessary that I do this. It was a rational plan. I did it logically. And if you understood this all-seeing eye, the way it looked at me, you'd do it too. One of Poe's earliest tales, the manuscript found in a bottle. In 1833, Poe won a prize of $50 from the Baltimore newspaper, the Saturday Visitor. Poe had already written four tales the previous year, uh, the, the first year that he'd actually begun to write uh, fiction. He had certainly written some poetry s over several years by then, but 
manuscript found in a bottle marks a kind of apprenticeship in the writing of the um, tale. In some ways, it's a bit fragmented uh, and perhaps in some ways unresolved, too. The narrator, like most of the narrators in Poe stories, is a first-person narrator telling us the story, unnamed. All of Poe's uh, narrators are unnamed. There's an introductory paragraph about himself designed to give him credibility, so we will trust him. He paints himself as without imagination and very interested in physical philosophy. And by physical philosophy, we should probably understand something like physical science. He's read the wild fantasies of the Germans, and by what he means, he means by that the, the Gothic romantic writings, the romantic movement really uh, swept across Europe and England before it got to America. So he's talking about romantic Gothic sorts of fiction that he's read. And he can detect their falsities, he says. This introduction thus prepares us for a, a, a tale that purports to be accurate, a tale of truth. And from this point we embark then on a voyage, and in fact two voyages. The setting um, is the uh, Malay archipelago off the, uh, the southeast coast really of, uh, of Asia, uh, an area that comprises some 14,000 islands. The biggest ones, of course, are Sumatra, Borneo, and Java. And this voyage actually starts out at a place called Batavia. Uh, this was all the Dutch East Indies, and Batavia is the, was the capital named for uh, a port in Holland. Uh, today, that's Jakarta, the uh, capital of Indonesia. It's at the upper left, that is, at the northwest end of the island of Java. Java uh, runs virtually, it's about 600 miles long, it runs virtually east and west. And setting off from Batavia then, it would be on the north coast into the Java Sea, and the, the journey then moves eastward along the north coast. Uh, coast of the island of Java. Eventually they encounter a terrible storm and uh, there's only two survivors, the narrator and a Swede, and they sail on now driven by the wind and uh, there are huge storms and then finally there's a, a ship collision and the narrator f uh, finds himself knocked into the rigging of uh, the second ship and so a second voyage uh, begins. This story illustrates Poe's uh, tendency towards terror in many of his stories. Up to the collision of the two ships, it utilizes physical nature to create situations of um, terror. And among such elements of the physical world, of course, things that happen at sea are particularly terrifying. Uh, storms, sudden waves, uh, shipwrecks, these rank at the top of the list, and these are pretty heavily exploited by romantic writers wherever uh, they choose to write their stories at sea. Uh, Cooper certainly had some stories of that kind. Poe's um, narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym is a sea story, and Melville later on in the 1850s, of course, with Moby Dick and Mardi and a number of others, has uh, lots of sea stories. And all of these, of course, will draw in some way on the terrifying aspects of storms at sea. Through all of this, the narrator remains relatively calm and uh, collected, and therefore we, th we feel rather credible. The uh, the two voyages, however, signal two kinds of terror or fear in, in Poe's stories. The first, of course, is the physical terror that derives from the physical situation of the storm. The second is a kind of psychological terror. 
And uh, more and more we find this as we move on in the canon of Poe that psychological terror is uh, a kind of mainstay of, of his tales. On the second voyage, after he's this ship collision uh, and he's knocked into the rigging of a uh, second ship, this truly does become a fantastic voyage. No one on the ship knows him or responds to him. The captain doesn't even see him, so the narrator is able to go into the captain's cabin and get paper and pen in order to be able to write up the account that we're reading. And eventually, they're driven southward, uh, presumably past Australia and into the South Seas. And finally, the ship was whirled around and it, it's going down into a huge black hole in the sea. And the narrator entrusts his story uh, um, to, uh, to a bottle. And uh, it, it's clear that the attainment, that this is a voyage into some kind of knowledge, some kind of a strange realm of, of uh, knowledge, but it's also clear that the attainment of this knowledge, as the voyage would suggest, is going to uh, end up in destruction. A, a good example of, of the sort of imaginative use of language uh, in this story, the fact, the, the sense that it really is a, a um, fantasy, almost, is, is in this quotation where he, um, he says, while musing upon the singularity of my fate, I unwittingly daubed with a tar brush the edges of a neatly folded studding sail which lay near me on a barrel. The studding sail is now bent upon the ship, and the thoughtless touches of the brush are spread out into the world discovery. Uh, that's probably an impossible thing to happen, but in a world of, of impossibilities, uh, we, we read past uh, such impossibilities, but that's a clear signal that, that this, this voyage into these dark realms is, is truly a, an imaginative uh, voyage into the unknown. And as I say, it's a voyage that will lead to destruction. We are surely doomed to hover continually upon the brink of eternity without taking a final plunge into the abyss. It is evident that we are hurrying onward to some exciting knowledge, some never-to-be-imparted secret whose attainment is destruction. Now, in terms of the language model that we've used in this course, uh, voyages, if they are real voyages, use referential language, specific words referring to real places. And in a sense, this story starts out that way with the mention of a departure from Batavia, a sailing along the, the, you know, the coast of, of uh, the island and, and past New Holland, which is an old name for uh, Australia. If a story is metaphorical or spiritual, then the language used is imaginative. Words, in other words, don't refer specifically to real places. These are words severed from the real world, words used to evoke a separate reality. Ostensibly, this looks like a real world at the beginning, but more and more it moves over that line into a largely imaginary realm, a true separate reality. Now it's worth noting here the what we could call the mythology of the sea. Uh, we've mentioned some elements of this in the past uh, in this course. During the Age of Exploration, for instance, there was an elaborate mythology of the sea that frightened people from exploration. The tropics, for instance, were believed to be so hot that you would burn up. And this, for a long time, uh, affected the exploration southward along the coast of Africa. Those proceeded very slowly. 
and uh, uneducated sailors, as most sailors were on those old ships, really did believe this. Another uh, piece of mythology connected with the sea was that there were gigantic sea monsters and dragons uh, that, that could swallow um, ships. And, and uh, we had some pictures of these on the screen back about our third class in this course. Once the tropics were actually passed during the age of exploration in the, in the late 15th century, such mythic places were pushed into regions that were still unknown. And that meant into the South Seas and the polar regions. The, uh, the, the very the preternatural appearance of huge icebergs in the North Atlantic and near the south uh, tip of South America led to the idea that there were physical extremes in these uh, regions. And these, this sort of mythology that I'm referring to went far, far beyond the 15th century. As long as those realms remained unexplored, the mythology could persist that, that uh, approaching the extreme southern seas or the polar regions would result in a, a realm of real physical extremes. Various writers exploited this in, in uh, British literature, in uh, British Romanticism. Uh, Coleridge, for instance, in The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, uh, has a very strange phenomenon occurring in the southern seas. And Melville will see um, in, in his works, Marty and Moby Dick, there are very strange phenomena occur. And often these do occur in the Pacific or in uh, the Southern Oceans. Poe here uses the Malay archipelago. Now, of course, this had been colonized and colonized for probably three centuries, uh, actually colonized in the uh, first touched in the early part of the 16th century. So in the 19th century, it's already been colonized for 300 years, but it's, so, it's a place so far from American experience that it is a perfect scene for uh, this kind of sea mythology. And there's all kinds of examples of it in this story. There's the strangely calm sea with no wind at all. And if you um, read Moby Dick, for instance, there's similar scenes in, in that novel where the sea is totally, be they're totally becalmed for days on end with the, mirror, the sea just like a mirror of, of glass, a, dus a dusky red moon. There's, of course, the sudden storm, and that occurs at midnight. It would be interesting to go through the tales that we're looking at in this course and see how many strange things occur at midnight. Virtually every, everything, I mean, Lygea uh, uh, inhabits the body of Rowena at midnight. The uh, narrator in Telltale Heart creeps into the man's room at, uh, at midnight. This seems to have a kind of special significance to, to Poe. And then, of course, there's this death-defying uh, a voyage south and southeast, the narrator at another survivor, driven at ferocious speed past uh, New Holland. And of course, once past Australia, the ship truly is entering into the mythical realm of the unknown. This is, is really uncharted water, really not penetrated until late in the 19th century. Ships just didn't go down there. There was no reason to go down there. So this is a wonderful area to, to fill up with all kinds of mythology. Uh, there's, there's a scene just before the end where the sun rises only a few degrees. There's little light. There's only a dull red glow. And of course, what Poe is drawing on here is, is the fact that at the poles, you get a, a very long winter uh, because the, the sun never really rises above the horizon for months on end, and then you get very long summers. He's drawing here on the, the, uh, the winter aspect of that, and when the sun sets, he says, the fifth day has not yet dawned. He's writing his, his notes on this. 
So we're in that uh, six-month winter of the polar regions. And it's that kind of thing, uh, six months of light and six months of darkness, that gives rise to this mythology of extremes in the polar region. The ship itself is, is a supernatural ship which crashes down on them from a wave that seems to be hundreds of feet high. And the uh, narrator then, once on this ship, voyages seemingly unrecognized and unknown. It's been suggested that this is a voyage of the soul, a voyage from birth to death, the narrator secretes himself in the deep hold of the ship, almost like a baby in a womb, but soon he comes out as if he is born. There's all kinds of suggestions in the story that support this. The captain of the ship, who uh, might very well be likened to the soul, is exactly the same height and physical description as Poe. The ship, if indeed uh, it's an allegorical body, it can grow as a real body can grow. There is, for instance, this interesting quotation in the story uh, that the narrator cites. A curious apothe apothegm of an old weather-beaten Dutch navigator comes full upon my recollection. It is as sure, he was wont to say, when any doubt was entertained of his veracity, as sure as there is a sea where the ship itself will grow in bulk, like the living body of a seaman. Uh, that, that seems to be a hint that the ship is like uh, the body and the captain who resembles Poe and, and presumably resembles the narrator uh, is, is actually like the, the journey of the body through life, driven forward into the, the unknown, as of course one could say we all are. Tomorrow, next week, next month, next year is the unknown. We are, in a sense, um, being pushed constantly into the unknown. The, and of course, the ultimate meaning of this unknown is, cannot be attained in life, only in death only in the whirling of the ship down into a dark hole. The meanings in this story are opaque, vague, often very dark. It's a, a good story to illustrate Poe's method. Uh, his stories take place in an imaginative world. They create a separate reality with so many reverberations that we can only define them in terms of allegory or myth or symbol. The Fall of the House of Usher is a tale in the Gothic tradition. Desolate, lonely landscape, a remote place, a haunted house, ghosts or ghostly people, supernaturalism, the strange communication, for instance, that there seems to be between the brother and sister <coughs> Roderick and Madeline, the occupants of the house, and life beyond the grave. Those are all elements that, uh, that one finds in uh, Gothic uh, stories. The term Gothic, uh, of course, refers to those uh, amazingly decorated cathedrals of the Middle Ages, and stories that are Gothic have this sort of same kind of um, elaborate decoration and imagery. And of course the word has some, makes some sense too because there was a medieval revival as part of the Romantic movement. The medieval period uh, was, became an area of intense interest. The, the plot is simple enough. The narrator has been called by Roderick Usher who is in trouble the narrator tells the story how he traveled for days, how he reached the house, how he met Roderick Usher, the last of his line uh, in the Usher family, and then things begin to happen. Roderick's sister Madeline uh, sickens and dies. The narrator and Roderick Usher 
bury her in the basement uh, tomb of, of the castle. Sometime later, during a wild and stormy night, at midnight, the sister Madeline uh, apparently breaks out of the, the tomb, finds Usher, comes after him, one would say, falls him on him, and together they die. Thus, in terms of the family, this is the end of the ushers, the fall of the usher family. But it is accompanied by a literal fall. The house falls down into the tarn, the big black pond uh, out, out front, and disappears. Now, if we read this at a referential a level. Roderick Usher and his sister are twins. There is a strange, mysterious connection between them. Her sick and uh, oncoming sickness and oncoming death are certainly of great concern to uh, to Usher. It could mean that Usher is near death too, uh, because of the close. Uh, affiliation between twins. This must then be a factor in her, in her burial, and one question we need to ask here is, is she or is she not dead? If she is dead, and incidentally that would be again the supernatural interpretation that a 19th century reader would tend to put on this story, uh, would be that she was dead and, and that she came to life and broke out of the tomb. If she is dead, presumably Usher somehow wants to delay the, the actual burial of her to perhaps de de delay the finality of death that is implied in burial. And presumably this would be involved in preserving himself a little longer. Uh, this, of course, leads to the supernatural interpretation that it was so common in the 19th century, the rising from the dead. Uh, one might ask, of course, why she comes after Roderick Usher if this is the case. Uh, it seems a little unmotivated. The other possibility, of course, is that Madeline was not really dead. She was just in a coma. This would, um, this would mean Roderick's burying of her really is the entombment of a living sister. This approach, of course, has some problems too. It's difficult to, uh, to figure out why he would uh, murder his sister or attempt to murder his sister, although perhaps he simply doesn't know. Perhaps by entombing her, putting her in a kind of state of suspended animation, he hopes to uh, if she keep her from dying, even though she's not, uh, she's in a coma. Perhaps he thinks he can keep her from dying. But you see, these multiple interpretations become very difficult to. You can't settle on one or the other. Uh, all the various interpretations seem to work. The one thing that this does explain is, is why Madeline comes after him when she breaks out. This is clearly a matter of revenge. She's a little upset that he's uh, buried her alive. Which is it? Well, probably it's, it's not possible to be really sure. Both interpretations seem to work. There is, uh, of course, an interesting affinity that most readers will note. The occupants of the house seem to have a strange affinity to the house itself. The Usher family is old. The house is old. The family is divided. So is the house. It has a fissure down the center. And at the end, in the death scene, the house cracks down that fissure and, and falls apart and falls into the, the um, tarn. The house is thus a clue to the people as the people are a clue to the house. The house is ancient, moldy, and decaying. The family demise is the result of its ancient age. Roderick and Madeline are decrepit survivors of a very ancient line. They have developed a sickness which leaves them vulnerable. One could almost 
there, there of course are hints here, slight hints of incest, and one could even speculate if, if there has been incest uh, going back for several generations, which might account for these very, this very strange um, sensitivity that Roderick has uh, without the renewing of the gene pool, it's, it's often, certainly it was believed that uh, people might very well uh, develop strange traits um, over several generations. So their, their house with its fissure and its eye-like windows seems to be a, a kind of image of the head. The, the split in the uh, house then might suggest some kind of split in consciousness. Now this still does leave some things in the story untouched. One of these is the narrator. Uh, I think a rule of thumb that, that we can operate with in uh, dealing with these stories is that usually in a first person narrative what happens to the narrator is crucial and uh, we need to look at what, what is happening to this narrator. This is not just an adventure he had, something is um, really occurring here. We note, for instance, a quotation like this where he says, as he's approaching the house, there was an iciness, a sinking, a sickening of the heart, an unredeemed dreariness of thought which no goading of the imagination could torture into aught of the sublime. What was it? I paused to think, what was it that so unnerved me in the contemplation of the house of Usher? Perhaps um, he sees some aspect of himself here. And if we read this not on a referential level, but in a realm of pure imagination, we might say, well, Roderick and the narrator were friends in, in childhood. and. Roderick is calling Usher, or, or, or is calling the narrator back, as if calling him to relive certain things in his childhood, certain deep memories. This would perhaps suggest that the narrator's journey, while described externally, is in fact a kind of inward uh, journey into a decrepit house of consciousness where he discovers new things. He discovers, for instance, there is a sister that he never knew about, uh, which is to say a side of the narrator that he's unaware of. There are, as I say, hints of incest. In psychological terms, different parts of the soul interact in incestuous ways. High purposes, for instance, and lofty aspirations are often self-serving, ego-building. and one would perhaps uh, like part of the self to God, to die, to go away, to be buried. Madeline's burial then could be an attempted psychological burial, a, a repression of part of the self that the narrator would like to do away with. Her breakout then is, is psychologically a breaking of the dam, the refusal of that side of the self to uh, to be denied expression. And um, this does not uh, mean that her resurrection, of course, will be integrated into consciousness. Precisely the opposite, the breaking out of Madeline destroys the whole incestuous structure, which then comes falling down. The tarn, which the house disappears into, is an interesting um, element of the story. The house is reflected in the tarn. Reflected. A literal word referring to the way light reflects. But it also has a metaphorical meaning. When we reflect on something, it is as if we hold a mirror up to the world. It is as if our mind has an image inside of something outside. And the house and its reflection are thus, in a sense, a kind of image for consciousness. The whole decrepit structure of the house, the divided self, falls down, disappears into the, into the tarn, 
and the reflection of the mind somehow takes in and reabsorbs itself. And the narrator, to whom all this drama has occurred, escapes to tell the truth. Unlike the narrator of manuscript found in a bottle who doesn't escape and only gets his story out by putting it in a bottle and throwing it over the ship's side. The poem at the center of the story, The Haunted Palace, uh, is a kind of duplication of the story. And travelers now within that valley through the red litten windows see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody. While like a rapid ghastly river through the pale door a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh but smile no more. So in the fall of Usher there's no real house perhaps. It's a strange place explored by the narrator an elaborate metaphor for his own divided self, complete with dark dreams of incest, murder, dream, nightmare, things from the nether region which can finally bring down the house of consciousness. So we come to the poem, The Raven. Poe never made much money from his writing, nor even too much in the way of fame. The Raven brought him popular success. It was published early in 1845 in the New York Daily Mirror, immediately capitalized on this by bringing out uh, uh, a volume of poems called the, uh, the Raven and Other Poems. And a year later, he published an interesting work called The Philosophy of Composition, which was supposedly an explanation of how he wrote the Raven. He said, uh, it is my design to render it manifest that no one point in its composition is referable either to accident or intuition, that the work proceeded step by step to its completion with the precision and rigid consequence of a mathematical problem. Uh, the detailed process that Poe describes, a kind of logical, rational, step by step process is doubtful. It, it, this is probably a matter of, of sheer exploitation. He knows that he's going to get a lot of readers because the Raven got a lot of readers and has made him uh, famous. Uh, most uh, readers, and particularly poets that have looked at this later, have felt that uh, this, this really didn't describe anything accurately at all. But there is, of course, one quotation that seems central to the Poe canon. The, um, the death of a, a beautiful um, woman. Uh, the death of a beautiful woman is unquestionably the most poetical topic in the world, and equally it is beyond doubt that the lips best suited for such topic are those of the bereaved lover. The narrator in the the raven seems relatively sane at the beginning. He's engaged in uh, reading and study, nothing unusual. He's, he's suffering mildly for a lost lady love whose name is Lenora, but he seems to be coping. The bust of Athena above his door would stand for, uh, Athena was the goddess of wisdom. Uh, it's suggesting that the narrator is rational and, and certainly in control. But the poem traces a process of grief taking over, first entering the house, refusing to leave, and staying with him forever. A beautiful example of symbolism, grief enters as a black raven, takes a seat on the bust of Pallas Athena, which is to say grief takes over intellect and rationality. At first the raven beguiles the narrator into smiling, and the narrator does not connect the bird with anything at all in his own life. His main thought is, is hope that the raven will leave. But, and the narrator pulls up a cushioned seat in front of the uh, raven and tries to fathom the meaning of the bird, specifically why the bird keeps croaking one word over and over again, nevermore. Uh, and so far, that's just 72 lines of the poem, two-thirds of the poem. The uh, 
It's 108 lines long. The final 36 lines of the poem turns histrionic. The narrator uh, thinks about Lenora, but when he says he must try to forget Lenora, the raven says, nevermore. And now the connection has been made. The dialogue becomes very, very intense. The abstract word, nevermore, which seemed at first just a name for the bird, then a meaningless refrain is now directly connected to the lost lady, Lenora, and the raven becomes a total symbol, and his refusal to leave is, uh, represents a grief that shall have no ending. Uh, finally, the, the narrator appears to descend into madras, madness, shrieking, and so on. So the progress, the plot of the poem, if you will, is here is how this man went mad over his grief for Lenora. Now, the appeal of this poem probably has a lot to do with its extremely unusual metrics and uh, poetry. Here is, here's the pattern. Um, of rhyme the, for the first stanza. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more." The pattern here that's revealed is, an, in the first line, an AA pattern, and in the third and fourth line, a BB with, again, that repeated at the middle of the line. And then, four words ending in OR, here it's lore, door, door, and more, or, 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 and more. That pattern of rhyme, which gives the thing a kind of, it's a very complicated rhyme, and it's rather remarkable that Poe was able to keep this up for 108 uh, lines. Um, but what this does is it focuses the rhyme scheme entirely on the word nevermore. In that place where you see these, these or words in, at the end of the second, fourth, fifth, and sixth line, that occurs in every single stanza. And it occurs by the use of words like, there's the full inventory of words, lore, door, floor, before, Lenore, explore, your, war, shore, bore, outpour, store, core, or, assure, implore, and adore. Those are all used uh, in this poem. And the last line, um, is evermore, it ends in evermore in one stanza, it ends in nothing more in six stanzas, and with the eighth stanza, stanza the word nevermore becomes the focus, and from the eighth to the last stanza, eleven full occurrences, we get, um, we get the word uh, nevermore occurring. This gives to the, the poem a, a truly haunting um, sort of, uh, of quality. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what that thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as Nevermore. 
Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking that this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. Desolate, yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting, Get thee back into the tempest and the night's Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out of heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Well, Poe was good at horror. The Mask of the Red Death, a kind of mythic parable. The difficulty is partly knowing how to read it. The tendency when we read, of course, is always to read referentially, to treat words as referring to a real world where nouns and verbs represent things and events. Sometimes the story starts out that way, later we discover we're in a separate reality where words are being used imaginatively. The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and horror of blood. Those are the opening lines of the Mask of the Red Death. The the grammar leads you to think that the Red Death must be a pestilence, something like a plague. And of course, there are lots of suggestions in the poem uh, to, to suggest that that's what's being talked about. But that isn't necessarily the case. There are, are perhaps other meanings for, for this uh, Red Death. And, uh, of course, numerous interpretations of this poem have been brought forward. The, uh, briefly, what, what happens is that um, the, uh, this Red Death is devastating the countryside, and so Prince Prospero builds an enclosed castle, invites a thousand chosen people in. They bar and bolt the doors and let no one in or out, hoping to preserve these people from the Red Death. And then there's a great masked ball, and on the night of, of the ball, close to midnight, a stranger appears in their midst, wrapped in the uh, disguised, masked in the, uh, in the wrappings of the grave. And he walks through the seven rooms from the blue to the black room. <coughs> Prince Prospero follows him, and in the black room dies, and then various members of, of this uh, mask, this, this uh, dance, this party, if you will, 
fall upon this masked figure who looks like death, discover, discovers that it's a mask with no content. And then one by one, the people there, the thousand people there, all die. And it is clear that the Red Death got in anyway. Let me um, suggest, uh, if we come back to that quotation at the opening of the poem, the words avatar and seal suggest something very positive. Avatar is a kind of incarnation of a deity in life, in a living thing. Both avatar and seal seem very positive. Uh, they don't seem like the sorts of words that would be uh, particularly attached to a pestilence. Let me suggest that one way of thinking of what the Red Death is in this poem, what, what really is, is operating here, life itself. No pestilence has ever been so fatal or so hideous because life is absolutely fatal. Nobody escapes from it. And if you, I think if you read the story this way, then you arrive at the idea that, that what Prince Prospero is trying to do in, lock all these peop in locking all these people in a castle is he is trying to create a kind of eternal life situation where nobody will die. And, uh, and of course that doesn't work. The Red Death gets in anyway. And what about this stranger? Uh, dressed as death, but with no being underneath. Uh, it seems to me that this suggests that perhaps our idea of, of death is, is uh, rather warped. That death is not an enemy that attacks life from outside, that therefore we can shut out of the castle. Death is rather an integrated part of the cycle. Our idea of death as hideous, is very much a mask that we place upon death. But it's a fictional mask, hence when you unmask death, you find that nothing is there. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the mask here, which is a kind of drama, a mask is a kind of drama, all these people are disguised and so on, um, has a, another meaning. Life as we live it is very often made up of masks, of failures to know ourselves, of failures to understand the true identity of things, and things like life and death we sometimes misunderstand. We put them in masks and, and, and hide them with masks of our own making, and then we don't recognize them and we act upon the masks rather than the reality. It, um, it seems to me that the tale then is perhaps about how we delude ourselves how we fail to recognize things for what they are. Death is not the great disease hunting uh, down and destroying life. That's the horror image. And of course, Poe does play that up in the story rather nicely. Death is the seventh room of life. The blue room is birth. The black room is death. It's part of a continuous process. The normal progression is to move through the rooms. They're all linked. Uh, it's only when you try to lock the enemy out that you find that the enemy is, is within, and the enemy is not really an enemy. It's, it's, it's part of life itself. Well, we've talked about American Romanticism. Let me put up our outline here. To, to treat American Romanticism, we uh, we could treat it under these three headings. You've seen this before at the beginning of the last class. And just to, um, just to review, looking at the first point here, uh, the subject matter of Romanticism, we, we looked at this uh, last day. This is, this is not a new screen. We talked about the emphasis on the past, the European past, the American past, and these examples, as you can see, are all taken from the previous two writers that we looked at, 
uh, uh, Cooper and Washington Irving. Now, following on with that to additional uh, features of the subject matter of Romanticism, we, could, we talked about nature and the American frontier with um, Cooper and again with Irving. Now under the, the, the C point here, uh, idealized heroes and heroines. Cooper's leather stocking is the major example from Cooper's works. But now we can add in here with Poe, we can see that we have ideal heroines too. Uh, women as idealized characters begin to emerge in, in American Romanticism. And uh, of course we've got at least three examples uh, with Annabelle Lee, with Eleonora, and with um, Ligeia. And we could add uh, Helen in, in that short poem too. And these are not uh, these are not the, uh, the only ones. These sorts of idealized women uh, come up again and again in, uh, in, Poe's, uh, in Poe's writing. Now these are, these are all major uh, subjects of, that we find in American Romanticism, and we're going to find these cropping up in, uh, in later writings. The, idealized heroes and heroines we're going to find uh, coming up in Hawthorne's tales, and in Hawthorne's novels, and uh, we're going to find them also coming up in, in Melville's work, uh, idealized characters, sometimes evil, sometimes uh, good. But now we can move to some, some other uh, features of Romanticism that become particularly apparent in the writings of Poe. We have, for instance, in Poe, uh, a topic or the subject of madness and obsession. There are lots of examples in the in the um, in the Poe canon. Uh, I, mean, I have a collection here of of uh, Poe stories. This is a book that. Uh, runs nearly a thousand pages, and um, oh, a good 900 are his tales. So, what we're looking at, of course, are just those examples um, that are in the anthology that we're reading. But we have uh, two wonderful examples of madness and obsession: Poe's Tell Tale Heart, where the uh, where the uh, narrator is, while he's claiming uh, that he's a reasonable man and not mad, is, is in fact um, very mad. And of course uh, commits a, a murder in this madness and, and um, I've suggested that this story is a kind of cover-up uh, story. That is, not exactly a cover-up, but an attempt to justify the murder, uh, which is, of course, one approach, to, to say that the murder was provoked. Whether or not he does a very, the narrator does a very good job of, of that, the, the, the provocation seems to be the, uh, the overbearing eye of a kind of father figure. But never the, and, and maybe it's madness for the narrator to think that that will justify the murder. Uh, Certainly, he is an obsessed narrator, obsessed with this eye far beyond the reasonable. With Lygea, we have a clear case of obsession, with the narrator obsessed with this beautiful uh, woman, uh, to the point where uh, this, the second woman in the story that he marries, Lady uh, Rowena, simply does not measure up to Elijah, and in his obsession he goes on dreaming of uh, Lygea even while he is married to Re Rowena, even during their honeymoon, even 
when she uh, is dead and lying in state through the night, he is dreaming the whole time of, of Lygea. If this isn't a case of total obsession, it would be hard to find one. Uh, so madness and obsession are uh, something that we will find running through uh, uh, rom American Romantic literature. We're going to find it again in, in the stories of Hawthorne. Uh, certainly, we would find it in a novel like Melville's Moby Dick, where Captain Ahab is absolutely obsessed with this white whale. He's lost a foot, he has a pegged leg, and he's determined he's going to sail the world and find this white whale and kill it. Uh, this seems to be a topic that, that becomes very current in the uh, Romantic movement. Um, uh, another uh, element of content here, of course, is inward exploration. And uh, here we've got two good examples with Poe's manuscript found in a bottle, a journey and in discovery into knowledge that ends in destruction, the fall of the House of Usher, which seems to be the narrator's uh, exploration into his own conscious, his own divided consciousness. The difference is that one narrator dies, whereas the narrator of the fall of the House of Usher uh, escapes. Now, let me just remind you then again of the outline here. We've been looking at the subject matter of Romanticism. If we now move on to the second point, techniques of Romanticism, here is um, some familiar material. Uh, the techniques of Romanticism include epic presentation. We've seen that in Cooper. Uh, but in addition, symbolization in symbolism in characterization, the fair and the dark, the good and the bad. We've, uh, we've had examples from the previous class of, uh, of Cora and Alice in The Last of the Mohicans, the dark woman and the fair woman. We have it in Cooper's Indians, the good Delawares and the bad Hurons. But then when we get to a story like Poe's Lygea, we see that we have the same kind of pairing of the, uh, the fair-haired, blue-eyed, blonde Rowena and the raven-haired uh, Lygea. And uh, I've, I've got these a little reversed. Al it should be Alice and Cora, really, to be parallel. Alice is the, uh, the fair-haired one in Last of the Mohicans, whereas Cora is the dark, a dark woman. Um, so we get this kind of symbolizing, symbolizing uh, in character. In addition, in the techniques of, of American Romanticism, we have imaginative or fantastic settings. Uh, and Poe, of course, his stories just abound in these. The South Seas, in, in his uh, manuscript found in a bottle. If you read carefully the, uh, the story Eleonora, they move in the early part of the story in a place that they call the Garden of the Many Colored Grass. It's almost an Eden-like uh, setting. Prospero's castle in The Mask of the Red Death is equally an imaginative or fantastic setting. And remote and vague settings um, we find in The House of Usher and The Oval Portrait. Uh, Poe is almost a dictionary of uh, romanticism. And now to look at our, our last screen for this class, Gothic details. Uh, Gothic details include the use of desolate, mysterious, and, and ghostly things, uh, the use of the grotesque, the horrible, the terrifying. And House of Usher and Lygea illustrate this very well. Castles and decaying mansions, we find this in The Mask of the Red Death and The Fall of the House of Usher, and also in Lygea. And, uh, one wonders if crime was suddenly on the rise in the early 19th century. Murder seems to be a 
great topic of fascination for Poe. We find murders in the Telltale Heart, Ligeia, the House of Usher, the Black Cat, the ca Cask of Amontillado, and the murders of the Rue Morgue, just to mention a few of the uh, many um, well-known tales of uh, Poe. Well, Gothicism is one of his great additions to American Romanticism, but we're going to see that coming up again in the work of Nathaniel Hawthorne. Well, have a good day.